you are about to see the first of three films which have been made to help us size up our enemy Japan. To beat the Japanese and to do the job thoroughly, we have got to understand them thoroughly. What sort of people they are, how they fight, what they are fighting for, and the resources they have to fight with. You will see the harsh, unpromising land, small geographically and comparatively poor in resources, out of which, by making the most intensive and economical use of every inch of land, of every stone and tree and blade of grass, a fanatical people determined to conquer the world have built an empire strong enough to come within reach of this ambition. This is Japan. This is the land which the Japanese believe is the center of the universe. They believe it was plucked from heaven by the great sun goddess Amaterasu and set down upon earth as the home of a heaven descended race destined by its own divine right to rule over all the world and all the world's people. Because for centuries one dominant idea of Japan's warrior people has been to hasten their destined day of world rule, they have been working single-mindedly to make of this crowded, meager land a springboard for conquest of the whole earth. Out of decades spent in studying Japan's strategic geographical position, its distance from the bases and capitals of the nations it was bent on conquering, Japan's military leaders long ago evolved their plan to nullify these vast distances. By extending their power out over an ever-widening circle, they would in time place themselves within striking range of each of their objectives. To accomplish this grandiose design, Japan's strategists had at their disposal only the resources of a land not quite as big as California. But in that land lived a fanatical and ambitious population ten times bigger than California's. A warlike people who had for nearly a century been copying from the Western world whatever would be most useful to them in destroying that world. Most of Japan's principal cities, bustling and modern, are seaports, for its position as a great power has been based upon its world trade. Shipping out the products of its cheap labor to undersell European and American goods in the markets of the world, Japan imported in exchange for them all the raw materials essential to war that it was unable to produce from its own barren land. Thus, over a period of many years, Japan amassed enormous stockpiles of strategic materials. The 28,000 mile coastline of Japan, with its countless gulfs, bays, and inlets, is dotted with thousands of fishing villages. To the Japanese, the majority of whom live within sight of the sea, fishing is a vital industry. For without the protein supplied by eating fish, they would be unable to withstand disease and cold and could not endure the physical work they now perform. Stretching for 2,900 miles along the coast of Asia, the islands of Japan have a solid backbone of mountains. But this land, bleak and rocky as it is, is capable of supplying enough crops to provide the primitive standard of living 
to which the Japanese have been accustomed for centuries. In the valleys and along the alluvial plains, there are good farmlands, and these areas produce most of the food for Japan's armies and its population. Largest of these areas is the Kwanto Plain, on which Tokyo and Yokohama are situated. Nowhere in the world is such diversified farming carried on so intensively. Every inch of soil that will support livestock or growing things is used to produce food with which to nourish Japan's fighting man. Everywhere, there is the one main food crop, rice, still the universal staple of Japan's diet, although in recent years, government subsidies have raised the production of wheat and barley to compensate for Japan's traditionally small grain crops. In mineral resources, the islands of Japan supply more than half of its anthracite and soft coal. Of copper, an essential in its war economy, Japan produces over 50% of its needs. A substantial part of its supply of iron ore comes from its own mines. 50% of its oil comes from Japan's own fields. Japan has always had an exportable surplus of sulfur. Japan's power supply is chiefly hydroelectric. A network of plants makes it the fourth most electrified nation in the world. Railroads planned with military needs in mind link all its major ports and towns in a web of communications that permit the transportation of parts manufactured in small dispersed factories to key assembly points. Japan's railroad system is highly vulnerable to air attack, for there are few duplicating lines which could bear the load of wartime traffic if the main lines were broken at strategic points. A large part of Japan's heavy industry is located in northern Kyushu and along the coast of the Inland Sea. Into these mills and factories for more than a decade, Japan has been pouring all the steel and iron, all the strategic materials it could produce, all the vast quantities it could extort or purchase in the outside world, to be turned into armaments and weapons to build up its war machine, the instrument of its conquests. Working with savage determination, turning their whole productive effort to war, the people of Japan have been fighting one war while preparing for a greater war since 1931. Out of their resources, carefully husbanded, they have built up their industrial establishment and amassed their stocks of finished arms and munitions or upon this greater war, their very destiny depends. Today, still a formidable power on sea and on land, Japan is a relentless enemy of the civilized world, but one that can and will be beaten. For the United States has mastered the stern lesson Japan learned long ago, that only a nation which can bring into full play resources all its wealth and all the utmost energies of its people can win through to final victory.
are about to see the second of three films which have been made to help us size up our enemy, Japan. To beat the Japanese and to do the job thoroughly, we have got to understand them thoroughly. The Japanese are not easy to know. I've lived among them for 10 years and I can testify that they are as different from ourselves as any people on this planet. The real difference is in their minds. You cannot measure Japanese sense of logic by any Western yardstick. Their weapons are modern. Their thinking is 2,000 years out of date. To the 70 million people of Japan, Hirohito, their emperor, is a god through direct descent from the great sun goddess, Amaterasu. They believe that he personally owns Japan, its land, its resources, and even themselves. And they believe that it is the right and destiny of Japan's emperors to rule the whole world. To bring about the fulfillment of this destiny and to destroy all nations and peoples which stand in the way of its fulfillment is the sacred duty of Japan's army and navy. The army of Japan is a well-trained, sternly disciplined force of fanatics deal to reckless courage by a primitive moral code which assures to every man who dies in battle an immortal life among the Shinto gods. Behind the fighting forces stand all the wealth and power and resources of a people whose national dream is to see Tokyo established as the capital of the world. From Tokyo, the Japanese have for over 11 years been carrying on one long, uninterrupted war. Again and again, Western economists have predicted that Japan's economy must soon collapse. But Japan is stronger today than ever before in its history. An adaptable people, the Japanese have made good use of the inventions and conveniences of the Western world, which might fit in with the plan for world conquest, which is their national obsession. Non-essential industries in Japan have been all but wiped out, for the empire has recognized but one need, the need for the materials of war. Efforts to hold down prices have failed and inflation has decreased the purchasing power of the yen. Japan's gold supply is carefully hoarded, no longer forms a basis for her money, but Tokyo's bankers see their turn coming later when Japan begins exploiting the lands it has conquered. Most eagerly sought securities on the Tokyo Stock Exchange are the shares of government-controlled corporations set up to develop the gold and iron and timber of the Philippines, the abundant rubber and tin of Malaya, the oil and quinine of the Dutch East Indies, all the raw materials needed to make Japan self-sufficient in a war which many of its leaders believe may last a century. Never an inventive or creative people, the Japanese have always depended on the scientific and industrial knowledge of the Western world. And now that they are at war with Britain and the United States, they find their chief source from which to borrow fast-changing production techniques in Nazi Germany.
In the theaters of Japan, Nazi methods of propaganda are also copied to good effect. The Nazi concept of total war is highly satisfying to the Japanese mind, for throughout its modern history, Japan has been a totalitarian state preparing for total war. Playing their closely supervised part in total war are Japan's metropolitan newspapers, which ape the great American dailies. For a stick of type can be set, it must be approved by the army, the navy, the police, and the foreign office. No story or editorial, no picture or cartoon may be printed which opposes the concept of a Japanese-ruled world. Thus, to the Japanese reading public, the progress of their holy war is an unbroken succession of triumphs. Every disaster becomes a victory, and all news is good news. For every channel of public information is being used to impress upon Japan's people that the war is proceeding according to a divinely guided plan and that the people's part is merely to double and redouble their sacrifices on behalf of the emperor and of their sons and fathers away at the front. The greatest single source of Japan's fighting men is its peasant population, long used to hard work and self-denial, toiling from before dawn to long after sunset. The farm family accepts hard work and squalor with the unfeeling stoicism of a disciplined race. Homes are crudely built with a framework of wooden beams and walls of mud and chopped straw. In these huts, Japan's peasants have for generations raised sons to fight for their emperor. There are few luxury crops in Japan today. Practically everything has been replaced by crops which give the greatest nourishment. All grain and rice belong to the state. The whole crop is bought by the government at a price just high enough to keep the peasant alive and working. And in a nation where land is the chief source of food and life, no square foot of farmland, however meager, is left untilled. To protect its supply of hardwood, Japan has for years practiced reforestation on a national scale. And today its lumber, like everything else it produces, is going into the war effort in one way or another. To make sure that on the farm not an hour is spent in idleness, no material is wasted. Every rural community produces useful handicrafts. In the towns and villages, home industry is also the rule. And in these homes lies much of Japan's industrial strength. With each home, a miniature factory the nation's total production is almost beyond estimate. With the same fanatic zeal that inspires the soldiers whom they so devotedly support, the Japanese people are today working for the destruction of the land they fear and hate most of all, the United States. A land which more than any other the Japanese have cause to remember with gratitude and affection. For when, in 1923, Japan was racked and broken by an earthquake, it was the United States which was first and most generous 
in giving aid. Into Tokyo and scores of other shattered and suffering cities poured millions of American dollars, shiploads of American supplies to save lives, to heal the injured, and to help rebuild Japan. Today, Japan's restored cities are filled with mills and factories turning out materials of war. In these factories, there is no shortage of labor. Farms and villages comes an endless supply of girls eager to contribute to the war effort for a year or two before they marry and begin bearing sons for the army and navy. Willing to work 14 hours a day for little more than room and board, they find factory meals of boiled rice fish and tea, better fare than they had at home. Since nearly a decade before Pearl Harbor, Japan's heavy industry has been mobilized on a war footing. Its materials, machine tools, and workmen integrated into a long-range program to build up and maintain the Japanese war machine. To make up for shortages of strategic materials, it accumulated great stockpiles of raw materials by importing them from China, India, the Netherlands East Indies, and from Western nations. Japan's state religion is Shintoism which teaches that Japan is a heavenly land protected by their gods who have even taken the form of a divine wind which scattered and confounded enemy fleets. Shinto gods exist in rocks, trees, and rivers, and even the souls of men who have died for their emperor are worshipped as minor gods. And in the immemorial fashion of these ancestors, they fortify with pageantry and savage symbolism their belief that innumerable and very fierce deities have destined them to be the conquerors of the world. Early in life, Japanese school children learn to feel the proper reverence for national heroes, for by implanting such devotion the empire is assured of a youth imbued with fanatical courage and militarist ideals. From infancy, Japanese children find their days strictly scheduled to the discipline of total war. In physical culture groups, they harden their bodies learn the obedience to orders which will make them good warriors in later life. By wreaking pitiless destruction upon unarmed cities and their helpless people, and by slaughtering all those who stand in Japan's way, the young Japanese will win honor and grace in the sight of his gods. For they have decreed that it is Japan's destiny to achieve mastery over the whole world, to bring to all peoples the blessings of the samurai code. In learning to read and write the complex Japanese language of more than 4,000 characters, there is stern discipline for the mind. Never are they allowed to forget that the way of Japan is the way of the warrior, and that modern weapons of war are as glorious as the samurai swords with which their ancestors won honor and immortality. To the Japanese child, these are not mere planes and ships, but symbols of the conquering might 
of his august emperor. As he grows older, the future Japanese soldier devotes a large part of his time to the study of warfare. He learns to submerge his individuality in mass drills and maneuvers which teach him the fundamentals of the life he will soon lead. He is taught how to handle a rifle under a drill master who is both able and severe. He is trained so that handling a gun becomes second nature to him in preparation for the time when he will be a full-fledged soldier ready to die for his emperor. Anticipating worldwide expansion, Japan has for years maintained a school of military government and colonial administration where Pikjung Japanese learn the approved attitude and method of ruling conquered people in a conquered territory. The emperor's future Gauleiters lead a Spartan existence, become used to the simple rations which must be their lot until the day of final victory. At 17, every Japanese becomes automatically eligible for military service. And on his induction into the army, his years of military training and ingrained discipline begin to serve the nation. Averaging only five feet three in height and 117 pounds in weight, the Japanese soldier is expected to compensate for his small size by his fanaticism in battle. Under the eyes of an elite corps of officers, the new soldier spends nearly two years learning how to take care of himself. And it is a matter of pride with each Japanese soldier that he conform to the accepted pattern. He is taught that the greater the odds are against him, the more glorious will be his death. Building on this foundation of the will to conquer, the Japanese have made good use of the offensive spirit which inspires their people. Today, they believe themselves well on the way to realizing their imperial dream. The dream of uniting all mankind into one worldwide household with Japan at its head. This, then, is the enemy. Primitive, murderous, and fanatical. This people, this war machine, this empire can be beaten. But let us make no mistake, for total victory, we must make total sacrifice. Against the madness of Japan, nothing less than all our efforts will suffice to bring peace and security in our time. Music